Greetings in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we are again for another installment of our Show Me Your Glory series during ordinary time of this church year. And today we look at a very intimate, wonderful thing about the Lord, our God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the triune God, the Blessed Trinity. He is everywhere present. <laughs> We are looking at today God's omnipresent, and we're using this wonderful psalm, Psalm 139, 1 through, through 12, where essentially the Lord will make the argument that everyone everywhere, no one anywhere can hide from the presence of the Lord. If you look in some ways at the human predicament the most fundamental issue with us is where are you? <laughs> That's what happened in the garden, you recall. After Adam and Eve, after uh, eating the fruit of the garden, they became self-aware at a level that they knew that they were naked and they hid themselves. And the Lord's first question after that is where are you? Where are you? And, and where we are is pretty important. <laughs> Uh, when you think of God's where, you know, his, he, I thought this was sort of corny, but sort of, sort of cute too. Uh, wherever the Lord is, he's, he's here and here and here and here and here and here and here. God's map of the universe is that he is everywhere, which is different from us. When it comes to us, it's, it's more linear. We were here, <laughs> now we're here, and soon we will be over there. Sort of like when you think of human beings, you think about our history, and our history is related to uh, our lives. You know, we were in Wichita, we left Wichita, and went to Wheaton outside Chicago, went from there, our family went to uh, University of Iowa in Iowa City. Then we came back to Wichita. It's sort of like this cartoon. Uh, most of the time, morally though, when we think of where we are, it's we're, we're not where we want to be. Uh, I like this cartoon, I think most of all. You are here. You thought you were here. You should be here. <laughs> Those are the three great crises morally of every one of us. Where we are, where we think we are, and where, quite honestly, we should be. And unfortunately, those three things never tend to jive very well. Where we are, where we thought we, 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 we were, and where we should be. You are here, you thought you were here, you should be over there. <laughs> well, the interesting about our God with, and the scope of this known universe, nothing can contain him. It's very clear from the scripture. We've covered this in previous sessions. You cannot find out uh, a place where God is not. God is everywhere. He cannot be contained. Uh, the, great, the great pictures of the Hubble Deep uh, Field Collection of space are just spectacular. And every single, every single uh, speck in all of the collections are galaxies. If, and th these were shot into total blackness and, it, and they opened the shutter on that thing for 11 days to get all the light they could. And these were some of the photographs that came back the scope of this universe, every single one of these objects in these photographs are galaxies containing hundreds of millions of stars. So just to, just to even try to imagine the, 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 the largesque, the size, the glory of our great God is not possible. He is beyond anything we could ever think 
or dream or imagine. And he made this beautiful place for us to dwell. This is where we are on earth. Now, what is really clear in the Bible is that our God really does, in fact, speak about his presence in an imminent way. He is dwelling among his people. He was there with them, guiding them uh, with, with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, as this painting depicts. Our God declares that his presence is in the midst of his people. This is, the, the scriptures declare that our God wants to dwell in the midst of his people. Tozer says on this, and again, all of our quotes are from uh, his book, which we're using as a guide, The Knowledge of the Holy. Uh, in the chapter on omnipresence, Tozer says, the Bible's passages declare that God is imminent in his creation, that there is no place in heaven or in or earth or hell where men may hide, where women may hide from his presence. Those scriptures teach that God is at once far off and near both. He is both transcendent and imminent. And that in him, people move and live and have their being. God is not only transcendent beyond creation, he is imminent within his creation. And that leads us to our thesis for this particular teaching. Our God is omnipresent. He's all present. He's everywhere present. He is present in every place and nothing and no one can hide from his presence, either in heaven or in earth or in hell, in Hades itself. Our God is everywhere present. Now, as we normally do, we're going to look at Psalm 193. 139 verses 1 through 12. We'll observe the facts and interpret the text. We will draw out a principle and then we will think about how we can apply that principle to our own lives related to God's presence, his presence everywhere. It's a very intimate, wonderful idea. God is present and hopefully we can glean a truth that can shape our own walks with him out of this. So let's begin. What do we observe in Psalm 139, 1 through 12? Well, in the first six verses, I have entitled those, the psalmist says, you know me. <laughs> God has a comprehensive understanding of us, every part of us. God has never learned and never can learn anything about us. Our prayers have technically never informed the Lord about us. He is perfectly aware of everything that has to do with every facet of our life from birth to death. And he knows those things simultaneously at every level for all of us. It's a, it's a comprehensive knowledge of human life. This is how it begins in Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways, all my ways. I love that. He's acquainted with every one of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge that you comprehend me like this, it's just too wonderful for me. It is high, the psalmist says. I cannot attain it. You know me. That is what we get out of that first, those first six verses. God's knowledge of us is thorough, complete, perfect, and comprehensive. He begins by saying, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. That shouldn't be hard for us to fathom since he created us, right? He made you. He made me. He knows us inside and out. He searched us and he comprehends us. He knows us. He says, the psalmist says, 
You know everything about me when I sit down and when I rise. You know all my paths. You know when I lie down. You know when I, when I wake up. You are acquainted with every one of my ways. You're intimately aware of everything I do. As a matter of fact, even before I say a word, even before it comes out of my mouth, you know it all together. You completely comprehend me. I, I, I love the verb, you hem me in. <laughs> he is completely surrounding us. His, his uh, knowledge of us is so comprehensive. He hems us in behind, before, and he lays his hand on us. And then the psalmist, just sort of overwhelmed by the comprehensive knowledge of God about us, he says, this knowledge is... It's just too wonderful for me. I, I can't, if I were to try to attain to this knowledge, I'll, I'll never attain to it. It's too wonderful. It's too high. It's beyond what I can know. You know me. That's where he begins this knowledge of his own omnipresence. It's in that context of God's comprehensive knowledge of us that he talks about in this text his, his omnipresence. Uh, I, I love this, this, this idea of uh, the Lord knowing us. It's a foundational idea. It's, it's one of the reasons why you can't hide from God. You can't, you can't play him. <laughs> you, can't, you can't run circles around him. You can't sort of deceive or manipulate him because he knows you. Jeremiah 12, 3 says, but you, O Lord, know me. How clear can that be? You see me and test my heart toward you. And then he goes on in the context. He was talking about some of his enemies. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. But you, O Lord, know me. You see me and test my heart. The same sentiment is given in Psalm 7, verse 9. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous ones, you who test the minds and hearts, O oh, righteous God. He knows exactly what is going on in me. I cannot hide from him. I, I, he knows me. He searched me. He's hemmed me in before, behind. When I lay down and rise, he has tested my mind and heart. And, and in one, to me, one of the great texts that establishes this in all of the Bible, Jeremiah 10, 23 and 24, I know, O Lord, that the way of man, the way of humankind is not in themselves. That it is not in a person who walks to direct his or her steps. Correct me, O Lord, but in justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Lord, I know it's not in a person to know their own ways. They can't. People don't know themselves well enough to, do, to direct their steps. I can't see around walls. I can't see over, over, over them either. I, it's not in a person. To, the way that I should take is not clear to me alone, but it's clear to you because you know me. And because of that, you can correct me. Tozer will, will, will say in this that God is, I think in this, this text we just read, God is like our environment. He's like, he's like our atmosphere. He is, we dwell in the presence of God. The scriptures teach, Tozer says, that God is infinite. That means that his being, his being, knows no limits. Therefore, there can be no limit to his presence. He is everywhere present. He is omnipresent. In his infinitude, he surrounds the finite creation and contains it. You hem me in, beside me, before me, behind me. His infinitude surrounds us, Tozer said. There is no place beyond him for anything to be. It's not like you, you can't think of a place where God cannot be. God is our environment, Tozer says, as sea is to the fish and air to the bird. 
We are hemmed in by the presence of this God who is everywhere, who is infinite in his presence. He is omnipresent. So if that's true, that God knows me, then hiding really won't work. <laughs> Hide and seek was one of the favorite games uh, that we did. We were a big family. There were eight of us. And when it was dusky, it was the perfect time to go and play hide and seek. And, and look, I was a champion guy. I didn't, get, I didn't get caught very often with my brothers and my sisters. But you can't play hide and seek with the Lord. It's not going to work. He's present everywhere and he sees everywhere you are. Where you are, not just physically, but in your own heart is known to the Lord. Uh, verses seven through nine says it like this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Psalm 139. Or where shall I flee from your presence? Where shall I go? Where shall I flee? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the abode of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. Dear friends, hiding from God doesn't work. The psalmist is just logically reasoning. You know me, you search me, you hem me in. You know my lying down and my, 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 my coming in and out. You know everything about me. And therefore, wherever I would run, you're going to always be there. This is a wonderful thing. God has always preceded you wherever you've gone. You've never gone to a place in your life where God was not already there first. You cannot hide from God. He is present everywhere. I like the rhetorical question, the, the, the questions that, that the psalmist begins with. Where shall I go? Where, where shall I hide? Where can I get from? And he answers the question, heaven? What if I go up to heaven? What if I go all the way down to the earth? Those are like, like bookends, right? <laughs> in terms of presence. What if I go all the way up to heaven? What if I go to the abode of the dead? Can I hide there? Where shall I go? Where can I hide? Let's say I took wings and I was able to flap them to the very remotest parts of the sea. Could I hide from you there? Could I get away from you? And the psalmist is clear. Nope, you are there. I would be led and held by your right hand, even in all these places, heaven, Sheol, and the uttermost parts of the sea. What about darkness? Perhaps I can hide in the darkness and just, maybe I can, there's a place I can be where God is oblivious to what I'm doing. He doesn't see me. I'm doing what I'm doing on my own. He, he doesn't have access to where I'm at. The psalmist says, <laughs> the darkness and the light are the same to you. The dark and the light are the same. The Lord doesn't need infrared glasses. <laughs> the Lord doesn't have to see better at, in the dark. Everything is the same. He is everywhere present. And because of his wisdom and knowledge, because of his authority and power, because of who he is in himself, there is nothing and no one who can hide any place from his gaze, from his sight, from his knowledge, from his presence. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Look, I think the only way to get at this is through his rhetoric. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, God could just come out and say, I'm everywhere present, but he, he, he would rather you reason on this, as Jeremiah 23, 23, and 24 says. Am I a God nearby and not a God far away? I mean, what, what do you think? He's asking us. Can a man, can a person hide himself in a secret place 
so that I cannot see him or her, declares the Lord. And then he gives the punch of it all. Do I not feel heaven and earth? I him in my creation. I him in you too. Do not I feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Now, this idea that God knows all, is in every place, is as intimate as my breath, that there's no place in heaven or on earth or under the earth that I can go should be profoundly comforting to us. <laughs> it, it gives extraordinary weight to the meaning of our lives, that wherever we are, Guys, in life, in death, in birth or old age, whatever path you take, God Almighty is there. It's a personal doctrine. It's a marvelous doctrine. And it adds value to our little vulnerable, puny selves. Uh, Dozer put it this way, the doctrine of the divine omnipresence personalizes our relationship to the universe in which we find ourselves. This great central truth gives meaning to all truths. Thank you. And imparts supreme value to our little lives. God is present, friends, near us, next to us. And this God sees us and knows us through and through. God is close by. Perhaps you have gone in your own lives where you have felt as if God were far away. But dear friends, that's not conceivable. God is clear. Look at his description of his word in Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Goes right to the bone that the author says, discerning the very thoughts and intentions of our heart. And no creature, listen to verse 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Dear friend, that includes you and me. You are literally naked and exposed to his eyes, this one whom you and I must give an account. Dear friends, what, what should we learn from this great passage? You know me and hide and seek won't work. What sh how should we interpret it? It's very simple. No one anywhere can escape the presence of God. To all beings and before all things, our God is here. <laughs> God is not, God is here. Does that mean God is like closer, imminently in the church than he is outside? Guys, you can't look at God like that. God is not limited in terms of presence. He is everywhere present. He, he, he formed us. He is everywhere. Amos 4.13 says, for behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the winds and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. He made the things that we, we have. They are the result of his own making. Again, this is the emphasis in this text. Where should, shall I go from your spirit? Where? Where is, is there a place where you can flee from the presence of God? The psalmist says the implication is plain. If you ascend to heaven, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in, in the underworld, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Even there. That's why I wanted to look at this verse again. Those two words at the beginning of verse 10. Even there. So you can use that for any place you've ever been in your life, in any place you will ever be, in life, in death, with friends and family, alone or, 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 or in love. No matter where you are, you are never alone, ever. 
even there in heaven or Sheol or in the, uh, in the uttermost parts of the sea, his hand will be there and he will lead us there in his right hand will hold us right there, even there in heaven in Sheol, in the uttermost parts of the places where we, we may journey. So what principle emerges from this? Guys, <laughs> this to me is the way you can, this is the easiest way to understand this text. Don't play hide and seek with the Lord. Just because you're not talking to him doesn't mean he doesn't know what you're thinking. <laughs> just because you're not intimate with him, just because you don't, you don't relate to him a lot, dear friends, he still knows you anyway. You will never be able to win a game of hide and seek with the Lord. Don't play it. You cannot win. Now, if there is a poster child for this principle, it's Jonah. You recall his story. God told him to go and to preach to, to Nineveh and to warn them of impending judgment. But a verse, according to verse three, he rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. In that interesting language there. He rose to run away to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He was trying to get away from God. So he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Look at how the writer of Jonah puts it. He's running to escape God's presence. He buys a fare. He's making a trip. He goes down there. He pays the fare, jumps on the ship. He's trying to get away from God's presence. He thinks he can do it, but he didn't. And the whole story of Jonah is that he could not get away from God's presence. You know what's really extraordinary about all of this is that the Lord is so high, so big, so great that even in his presence to look upon us, to find us, he has to stoop down. In the Hebrew, it literally says he humbles himself in verse six. Look at this in Psalm 113, four through six. The Lord is high above all nations in his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who stoops down on the heavens on, and the earth? who looks far down, dear friends, on the heavens and the earth. He's not contained by anything. He hems it in. He is not, he's not, you can't win with hide and seek because all of creation everywhere is bounded by his mighty presence. This is in an extended quote, I, I apologize just right, right away, but Tozer made such an important point on this that we need to think along with him on this. God's presence, because of his, his intimate uh, access to us, this can be a source of joy for us or pain. Tozer says, the certainty that God is always near us, present in all parts of his world, closer to us than our thoughts, should maintain in us in a state of high moral happiness most of the time. Most of the time, we should, be, we should be aware of that. It should comfort us. We should be healed by it. But Toza says, but not all the time. It would be less than honest to promise every believer continual jubilee and less than realistic to expect it. As a child may cry out in pain, even when sheltered in its mother's arms, so a Christian may sometimes know what it is to suffer even in the conscious presence of God. Then he quotes, though always rejoicing, Paul admitted that he was sometimes sorrowful. And for our sakes, Christ experienced strong crying and tears, though he never left the bosom of the Father. Dear friends, simply because God uh, hymns us in, knows our lying down and rising, is before and behind us, does not mean that that presence is going to intervene in every struggle. Sometimes that presence, we will experience it in the midst of either joy or suffering. And that's an important point to make. This is illustrated to me very powerfully in Paul the Apostle. 
In the second epistle that he wrote to Timothy, shortly, most scholars believe, before uh, he, he would be released and ultimately executed under Nero. This is what he wrote his friend, in uh, uh, Timothy, about his experience uh, in the gospel. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he, is, he strongly opposed our message. In my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. Paul knew just mind-numbing loneliness. Everyone left him. He was all by himself. And he prays here that it wouldn't be charged against him. But he says, but the Lord stood by me. Even in the midst of me being alone and nobody being with me and me going through all of this trouble and trial and depression and toughness, the Lord was still there. The Lord was there. He stood by me and strengthened me so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. That's the assurance. The, the assurance is not that he will lead you on your journey to where there will be no suffering or pain, where there will be no challenge or trial, where there will be no trouble or tribulation. That is not the promise. The promise is that he will stand by you and strengthen you in the midst of wherever you are. He rescued Paul from every evil deed and he said, ultimately, he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I can only imagine what it must have been like for Paul. <laughs> this, this, this converted jihadist uh, who was beaten and left shipwrecked, who was robbed and hunted down most of the time, chained to a soldier, uh, and yet... Uh, he, he knew and, and was, has been very clear about it. He was completely abandoned. He was deserted. He was by himself for a long period of time in, in, in his imprisonment. But he said, the Lord stood by me. And I love the way our, our, our illustrator, Tim Ladway, got this, uh, the way he did this, because this is, this is probably very close to the truth. Even in the midst of being alone and under trial, Paul shared the good news of our Lord with, with those in Caesar's household. So how do we make this truth of our Lord's omnipresence something practical, something we can live day to day with, something that can encourage us uh, moment after moment? How? We have to affirm the truth. The Lord is here. Dear friends, that, that, those four words are some of the most powerful that we could ever affirm in our walk with God, the Lord is here. No matter how far away he may seem, no matter how distant the Lord is, no matter how lonely and alone you may feel, the Lord is always present. He is always, he is and always will be with us wherever we go. Uh, I like the way Tozer referred to this. He, he called it a healing balm. <laughs> it distills from the garments of God's unfolding presence, he says. The healing balm distilled from the garments of the unfolding presence cures our ills before they become fatal. The knowledge that we are never alone, friends, calms the troubled sea of our lives and speaks peace to our souls. We are never alone, ever. The Lord is here. No man will be able to stand before you, the Lord promised Joshua in Joshua 1. No one will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Friends, embrace that truth. Embrace that promise. I will not leave you. 
I will not forsake you. That's why Joshua could move forward. And that's why we can move forward. He said in verse six of chapter one, be strong and courageous for you will cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. You know, probably the greatest testament in revelation of God's presence would come some centuries later in the form of a child who was born to a virgin. It was prophesied in Isaiah uh, chapter seven, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. <laughs> oh, there was a prophecy some seven centuries before the baby, Jesus cried uh, in the arms of its mother after birth. Matthew gives testimony of that moment. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is omnipresent, but there was a moment in history when our God came to us. He came to rescue us. He was born as a human child and he lived among us. And we, through his life, we saw God's glory and through his death, we received God's uh, salvation. Because God came to us. Oh my goodness, because God dwelled with us, we can have hope and know that we are never, ever alone. The coming of the Christ into the world changes the way we look at omnipresence. He's not just some faraway God. He came down. He was born to a virgin. He belongs to us all. Emmanuel, God with us. Our God is omnipresent. He is present in every place and nothing and no one can hide from his presence either in heaven or hell, or in the earth. Dear friends, uh, we know that God is going to dwell among us in the future because our Lord, the same one born, died and rose again. And he promised us that he would be with us until he came to rescue us finally. Jesus came and said to them in Matthew 28, 18, it reads, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. <laughs> he promised us that as we go make disciples in the name of the triune God of all nations, teaching them to observe his commands, that he would be with us. He would be with us always, even to the very end of this epoch, of this age. Because he rose from the dead, dear friends, we know that we're going to live forever with him. If there was more time, we could talk about his presence quite literally in a new city, in a new heaven and earth, that we will populate with all those who have ever believed in him. Dear friends, please, uh, this is one of these truths that every Christian needs every day and every hour. I need thee every hour, the hymn says. We can't live a moment without him. And what is so thrilling about this truth is that we don't have to conjure him up. This is an auto-suggestion or self-hypnosis. He is here. The Lord our God is here. Closer than your thoughts, closer than your breath. Cry out to him. Walk with him. Let him lead you, for he will never lead nor forsake us. That is his promise, and that is our future. May this ever be so in all of our lives. May we walk with the Lord who is close by. For Christ's sake, amen. Yeah.